Okay, so in this video, I'm going to run through the procedure of calculating an empirical formula. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a um, percent composition and then we're going to be applying a four-step process to that and from that we're going to be getting the what we call the empirical formula for our compound. Now if you remember, empirical formula is just the simplest ratio of the atom types that are present in your substance. So it's the simplest ratio of atom types. It's not too bad. So if I had something like that, H2O, that would be the empirical formula. If I had that, that would be an empirical formula. But if I had something like this, that would not be an empirical formula because we could simplify the ratio of atom types. Okay, so we can define the empirical formula of a compound as the smallest whole number ratio of the elements that are present. For an ionic compound, this is just going to be the same as the formula of the compound, but this may or maybe not be the same as the molecular formula. So for example, water is made up of molecules that contain two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And the molecular formula, which indicates the number of atoms that are in a molecule, is H2O. And that is also the empirical formula. But if we look at a molecule of hydrogen peroxide, has a Lewis diagram that looks like that, then the molecular formula, the formula that indicates how many atoms are in a molecule, has this form, H2O2, but the empirical formula is different. So we do want to keep that in mind that for covalent compounds, the molecular formula and the empirical formula could be different. So it's a four-step um, process to convert from percent composition to empirical formula. So the reason we like to do this is because we can measure the percent composition of a sample of matter, and then we can deduce what the formula is for that substance. So the first thing that we do is we calculate the mass of each element that would be present in a 100 gram sample. And this is pretty easy. It's just the percentage expressed as grams. So for example, if I knew that my compound was 66.3% carbon by mass, then I would know that I would have 66.3 grams of compound, uh, grams of carbon for every 100 gram of compound. So that's pretty easy, right? Now, once I've done that, I'm going to convert each of those masses, so in this case it would be 66.3 grams of carbon, into moles. And so to do that, you're just going to multiply it by 1 on the molar mass. So this would just be 66.3 grams of carbon times 1 mole of carbon for every 12.01 grams of carbon. And you can see that would cancel out, leaving you with moles of carbon. So in a compound, you're going to have a series of these things, right? You're going to have like percent carbon, percent hydrogen, percent oxygen, percent chlorine, whatever. And so you'll have a whole bunch of these moles depending on the number of um, elements that are in your compound and what you're going to do is take each of those molar values each of those numbers of moles and divide it by the smallest one in that set and then everything will become uh, one of them will become one the smallest one and then everything else will be a multiple of that so you'll have something like this you'll end up with one to x to y etc We'll look at an example in a moment. Now, what you're going to do then is if these are not whole numbers, you're going to multiply by whatever factor you need to to get it up to a whole number. So, for example, if you had 1 to 1.5 to 2, you can probably see if I multiply everything by 2, then that would be a whole number ratio. So if I multiply everything by 2, it would become 2 to 3 to 4. And those whole numbers become the coefficients in your formula. So let's have a look at some of this. It says an unknown compound containing carbon and oxygen 
is known to be or is composed of 27.29% carbon and 72.708% oxygen. So what I know is that I got 27.292 grams of carbon and I've got 72.708 grams of oxygen. Now my next step is to multiply these guys by one on the molar mass in order to turn them into moles. There we go, and that'll give me that. So that's what we're going to do in our next step. Convert the mass of each element to moles. And you can see that I've just multiplied by one on the molar mass. So now I've got two numbers. And if you remember what the third step was, it was divide each of these numbers by the smallest in the set. So I've got to divide that by that. And I've got to divide that by that. And so what happens is I end up with one carbon for every two oxygen. So that's telling me, because these are both whole numbers, I don't have to do anything more, that one is the coefficient of carbon and two is the coefficient of oxygen. So this fourth step convert to a whole number ratio. I know that carbon or oxygen are one mole of carbon for every two mole of oxygen. I don't need to do any more. So my empirical formula is CO2. Now, this could be the molecular formula. Maybe it is. But it could be the empirical formula, and then the molecular formula would be a whole number multiple of that. So that would be times 2, that would be times 3, it could be C4, O8, that would be times 4, and so forth, right? Okay, so it could be the molecular formula CO2, but it could just be the empirical formula and the molecular formula was different. So let's have a look at this one. It says, measurements show that unknown compound X has the following uh, composition. Write the empirical formula of X. So we got 38.7 grams of chlorine. We got 61.2 grams of oxygen. We get one mole of chlorine for every 35.45 grams of chlorine. And we get one mole of oxygen for every 16 grams of oxygen. So there's chlorine. There's oxygen. How many moles of chlorine do we have? How many moles of oxygen do we have? We have to do a little bit in the calculator here, right? 38.7 divide 35.45, and that gives me 1.09. Okay, and then 61.2 divide 16, and that gives me 3.83. So what one is the smallest one? Well, it's 1.0809, isn't it, right? So we're going to divide both of them by 1.09. So I get one chlorine, because this becomes one, for every three and a half oxygens. So to make that a whole number ratio in step four, I'm going to multiply that by two. So I get two chlorines for every seven oxygens. So it will be, remember we're gonna write our elements like, um, yeah, it will be Cl2, because there's two of them, O7, there we go. All right, CO2, O7. Now, if you're kind of worried whether you're on the right track or not, the first thing to check is, is it the simplest whole number ratio? And you can't get simpler than CO2, O7 because seven's an odd number. You can't divide through by a common multiple here. And then we, the other thing we can do is we can go to our molecular weight calculator and we can see what happens when we put that in CL. 207 
and it said that it was 38.8% chlorine, 61.2% oxygen. 38.6, it's pretty darn close, right? Now, you want to be aware there is a little bit of error in this data because that doesn't actually add up to 100%, does it? It adds up to 99.9%. Um, Right, so they give there's a little bit of um, uncertainty there because they cut it off to the first decimal place. All right, that's cool. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, so we've got three elements in this case, so it's going to be a little bit more um, elaborate. So um, we've got 38.7 grams of calcium. We've got 19.9 grams of phosphorus, and we've got 41.2 grams of oxygen in 100 grams of this compound. So we've got calcium, and then we've got phosphorus, and then we've got oxygen. All right. So we've got to times each of them by one on their molar mass. So in one molar calcium, we got 40.08 grams of calcium. In one mole of phosphorus, we have 30.97 grams of phosphorus. And then finally, in 41.2 grams of oxygen, in one mole of oxygen, we've got 16.00 grams of oxygen. There we go, do a dimensional analysis before we get to carried away. Everything looks good. So now we just do our math. So we've got 38.7 divide 40.08, should be a number less than one, and it comes out to be 0.966 moles of calcium. 0.966 mole of calcium. And we've got 19.9 divided by 30.97. So again, it's going to be a little less than a mole, isn't it? Because 19.9 is smaller than 30.97. So that ends up being 0.643 mole of phosphorus. And then finally, 41.2 divided by 16. So that's going to be several moles, isn't it? Because 41 is bigger than 16. So that ends up being 2.58 mole of oxygen. So now I have to pick the smallest of all of these guys. And it's got to be um, phosphorus. So everything ends up getting divided by 0 0.643. 0 0.643. 0.643. So what are we going to end up with? So let's do the first one. 0 0.966 divide 0 0.643. So I got 1.5 calciums. And then 0 0.643 on 0 0.643 gives me for, for one phosphorus. And then finally, uh, 2.58 on 0.643 that gives me four oxygens. So um, this is not a simple whole number ratio, so I'm going to have to multiply everything by two. And so then that's going to become three calciums for two phosphoruses for eight oxygens. So my formula here is going to end up being Ca3P2O8. Now, what I know that this is an ionic compound. This makes sense because this is, would be equivalent to saying Ca3PO42, which is the correct formula for calcium phosphate when you think about the charge. So I like that, that it came out to be like that. So that's a cool little example there. There we go. That looks great. All right, so they're all kind of the same, you know. So um, calculating empirical formulas is a really cool um, stepwise procedure. The first step is express the percentage as grams for each element. The second step is convert the grams to moles for each element. The third step is um, divide by smallest 
moles in set. And then the fourth step is convert to whole number to whole number ratio. So it's not too bad, you just gotta follow the steps. Alright guys, hope you found the video helpful. Good luck with everything.